Welcome to GabFest Reads. I'm David Plotz, one of the hosts of Slate's political GabFest. In 1977, when I was a first grader in D.C. public schools, Lafayette Elementary, the city was gripped for several days by an extraordinary event. And even today, 46 years later, yeah, 46 years later, the feeling of those days remains powerfully in my memory. So powerfully, I literally think about it every time I drive up 16th Street. And now Shahan Mufti has written an absolutely brilliant and mesmerizing and page-turning account of an event that you probably never heard of, but which was massively important in shaping America's relationship to Islam and to terrorism. Mufti's book, American Caliph, chronicles the 1977 siege of Washington, D.C., when a small Muslim group based in D.C., based out of a house on 16th Street, took more than 150 hostages in three buildings, killed a young Howard University journalist, nearly killed Marion Barry, then a city council member, soon to be mayor, and brought the city to a standstill. The Hanafi Muslim takeover of the B'nai B'rith, the National Islamic Center, and the district building was, and I think remains, the largest hostage taking ever on American soil. Shahan Mufti, you are chair of the Department of Journalism at the University of Richmond. Congratulations on writing a remarkable and magnificent book and welcome to GapFest Reads. Thank you so much, David. It's great to be with you. So there are so many threads in this book. It is a history of Islam in America. It's a history of the nation of Islam. It's a TikTok about a terrifying hostage situation. It's a story about the most ambitious movie ever made about Islam. It's also, incidentally, a story about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But it is most of all the story of Hamas abdul Khalas, who is the American caliph of the title. So, Jahan, start uh, by telling us a little bit about Hamas Khalas and who he was and the group that he led. So, right, Hamas abdul Khalas is the Muslim mystic of uh, in the title of the book. Um, and he is, I'd say, the one who wants to be American caliph, the leader of Muslims in America, among several other characters in the book. But Amasa Khalis is born in Gary, Indiana. Uh, he is uh, the grandchild of slaves. So his parents had moved north during the Great Migration from the south and, and settled in Gary, Indiana, where he was born in 1922. He... Um, I describe some of his childhood in the book, uh, but my readers really encounter him for the first time uh, when he's uh, serving in the U.S. Army. He's a Buffalo so soldier, and uh, he's about to get deployed to Europe uh, during the Second World War. But he, the reader sees him actually at a hospital getting a psychiatric evaluation. And that's really where the story begins in some ways, and, and this whole question of his mental condition uh, hovers through the book over him. He's let go of the, from, from the army um, and uh, collects from the GI Bill for the good part of his life, remainder of his life, but he goes on to do many other things. He ends up in Harlem, where he becomes a really successful jazz musician. So he arrives there just as bebop is developing and, and um, plays with some really successful jazz musicians of the time, but also also is, you know, a, a successful jazz musician in his own right, tours through Europe with a band uh, and, uh, and and then returns to New York. And, and it's in New York that he is, all, it's also, New York is a place, Harlem really is the place where he also encounters Islam for the first time. Uh, he, he kind of, uh, his understanding, his belief in Islam evolves uh, over his life. But that's the first time he encounters Islam in the shape of the nation of Islam, which was a very specific, particular um, group um, of African-American black nationalists. They were headquartered in Chicago, but had a strong presence in Harlem. And that's the place where he also meets uh, uh, a famous member of the nation of Islam named Malcolm X, who are both at Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem. I was really struck as you the parts about Harlem and the parts about him as a musician is how is it that Islam takes hold among black musicians so strongly? Why does that happen? Yeah, there were several versions of Islam uh, just that ran through Harlem. Some of them were, and, and a lot of them are coming from the, you know, Marcus Garvey's movement that had elements of Islam to it. 
Um, there was the Moor Science Temple, which was another Muslim, African-American Muslim movement that had organically developed in uh, the American Midwest as well. And then there was the Nation of Islam, and then there was just more traditional Sunni Islam that was coming through immigrants from Africa, uh, the Middle East, South Asia. So a lot of this was in Harlem at that time. Uh, but yeah, the jazz scene was particularly specifically gripped. With There was this fascination with Islam at the time. And uh, a lot of big names were, were, you know, subscribing to Islam, experimenting with it, dabbling in it. I mean, essentially, it was a really, it was an, a religion of empowerment for a lot of African Americans generally, because Islam, uh, the way it was being preached and understood in Harlem and in black communities all over the country was a religion that was uh, the original African religion. That was the religion that the slaves had before they got on the slave ships. So in a way, it was a reclaiming of the past. Uh, it was a reclaiming of a lost past. Um, and also, you know, a lot of people are drawn to it because um, of Islam's emphasis on equality among races, between races. So, you know, and that was helped by the lack of imagery in Islam as well. So there was a white Jesus that, you know, African Americans were used to seeing. It was a very white Jesus. But in Islam, there were no images of the Islamic prophet. There was no image of Allah. So in a lot of African American imagination at the time, this was a religion that had no color and it could have been black as much as it could be anything, you know, anything. And so, um, it, it really takes stronghold, and, and, and the Nation of Islam, though, was the first major organized Islamic group that really grew uh, among African Americans in the United States. The events of your book are enfold kind of around a big a, a conf a fundamental conflict between the Nation of Islam and the group that Khalas ends up leaving, the, leading, the Hanafi Muslims. So what is the nature of that conflict? How does it explode into these series of terrible events in the 1970s. So Hamas Abdul Khalas, so he really, he joins the Nation of Islam in the 1950s and just and shoots up the ranks. He is, is, is a really remarkable personality. Not only is he a great jazz musician, he's also uh, completed his undergraduate degree, first at Purdue, completed it at City College, New York. Um, and he's w one of the very few people in the Nation of Islam, at least, who is college educated. The Nation of Islam was already drawing from a lot of the incarcerated, so in, pri in prisons. Uh, the Nation of Islam was already spreading pretty quickly. Uh, so there were a lot of, you know, there, there was to be a college educated black man in the Nation of Islam was pretty unusual. Khalis really shot through the ranks. So and I, I, I explain in the book that it's overlooked, but Hollis was one of the top few people in that really important black nationalist civil rights organization in the 1950s. Um, there's a photograph in the photo insert of him, Malcolm X, and Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam. He was Elijah Muhammad's uh, personal secretary at a time uh, and the national secretary for the organization. So he was deeply involved with the with Elijah Muhammad's uh, personal life, he was scheduling his travel. He was writing. Some people said he was writing op-eds on behalf of Elijah Muhammad. Uh, it, but he does leave. He's ejected from the organization, or or is uh, kind of excommunicated from it uh, after a few years working directly under Elijah Muhammad in Chicago at the headquarters. Uh, he started butting heads with a lot of very important people in Elijah Muhammad's inner circle, and I describe those events in the book too. Uh, his departure from the organization after he leaves, soon after he leaves, though, is where he encounters Islam for the second time. Uh, and that is a the more traditional Sunni version of Islam, as practiced by many people in South Asia and the Middle East and Africa. That's uh, and that uh, message is coming to him from uh, an immigrant uh, Muslim from the Bengal region of of India, and uh, he c introduces Khalis to the Sunni Islam, but also. It, uh, fills his head with a lot of ideas about what the nation of Islam actually is. And in that 
telling it was a, a conspiracy hatched by Zionists to derail the growth of Islam in America. So basically, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam are a, are a Zionist plot, and they are sent to destroy Islam in this country and not let it take off. Khalid takes that to heart. And because of his bitter experience in the nation of Islam, makes it, it becomes a really, not, it's only not, not only a religious battle from him after, for him after that, it's also a personal battle to stop the growth of the nation of Islam, which is growing very quickly, but also it's the religious mission of spreading the true Islam of Sunni Islam, which he calls and his master calls Hanafi Islam and spread that throughout America. That is the struggle that, yeah, as you said, that is the tension that is driving a lot of the events up to the, the hostage taking in 1977 in Washington, D.C. End of 1972, Hamas Khalis started a letter writing campaign against the nation of Islam. Uh, and started to reveal a lot of what had been told to him by his own teacher, his Sunni Muslim teacher, but also drawing on his own inside knowledge of the Nation of Islam. And he cast Elijah Muhammad, like I said, as a Zionist agent, as somebody who was uh, uh, there to de derail Islam and a liar and all, all kinds of things. Um, that Nation of Islam reacted to that the letter writing campaign very strongly by sending a group of assassins to Washington, D.C., where the Hanafis were headquartered by that time. Uh, and uh, this, the an assassin's mission was basically to wipe out the Hanafi movement by assassinating Hamas Abdul Khalas, but also his followers. Uh, that turned into a bloody a horrific massacre at the Hanafi Center in 16th Street in Washington D.C. They did not. They did not manage to kill Hollis, but they did kill seven other people, uh, including four of uh, Hamas Hollis's uh, uh, children. Um, and uh, this one of the youngest one was just nine days old at that time, and he was drowned. Uh, uh, that baby was drowned, and all the other a few other children were drowned, and a lot of, and a few others, his, including his wife and daughter and two grown sons, were also shot. That is where this whole thing becomes very personal for Khalis as well. After the nation, he blames the Nation of Islam publicly for it, and soon after in a press conference, and from there the conflict just continues. And so what does he end up doing in March of 1977? Before I get to 77, between 73 and 77, he, there, is, there are a series of trials where Khalis is, uh, and the Hanafis are hoping to get you know, some kind of closure and justice. Um, the American justice system is moving too slow though, for them. And after four years of trials and retrials and mistrials, Hollis does decide in 1977 that he has, he simply had enough and hatches this plan to attack uh, these three locations in Washington, D.C., like you said, the B'nai B'rith on Rhode Island Avenue, the Islamic Center, which is just a couple miles away on Massachusetts Avenue, and then the district building, the which houses the city council, Washington's city council. What triggers this for him is is actually something entirely unrelated, which is a bio, this is a Hollywood film about the Islamic prophet that's just come out that day. This kind of interplay of things, these interplayer forces, is fascinating. But what, so what what does he do? They take over these buildings and demand demands what? A few hours on the morning of March 9th, Hollis and eleven of his followers. They, in three different groups, take over these three buildings. Seven men enter the B'nai B'rith, uh, take over the entire building, take over more than 100 hostages, most of them employees of B'nai B'rith, most of them Jewish. Uh, two, uh, three others go to the Islamic Center, take hostages there. Most of them are actually Muslim um, because it's the Islamic Center, and also some of them who had diplomatic or quasi-diplomatic status. Uh, and at the district building, two other Hanafis take over the fifth floor of the building where the city council is. Uh, that's the bloodiest location. That's the most violent uh, takeover of all. That's where sh there's a gunfight, f shots are fired by police and the Hanafis. And by, within a few, the first half hour of that standoff, there are three bodies lying on the floor of the fifth floor of the city district council of the 
uh, district building. Um, one of them, as you said in your intro, was a Howard University, young Howard University uh, radio journalist. Another one was a security guard. And the third one was Marion Barry, city councilman who was who would go on to become mayor. That is the takeover. It happens um, over a few hours, like I said. And by the time that things are happening in the district building, which is the third location, uh, the it's become very obvious to DC police uh, and also the FBI, uh, which quickly becomes involved, that this is a coordinated attack on Washington. This are not two, three independent attacks. This is all. This is all one, um, and that is where it's pandemonium in downtown Washington, things, places are getting evacuated. The national theater is evacuating thousands of people. Um, all, um, courts are getting emptied out. National monuments are closed. So uh, Washington DC by 3 PM that day on March 9th is under siege. And, and what does Hollis demand? So yes, Hollis, the, Hollis's first demand is about the movie. There's a movie about the life of the prophet Muhammad that's premiering in New York City and Los Angeles that day. Hollis wants that movie to not play and be stopped. And not only that, he also demands that the reels be removed from the United States. For a very for several hours, that's actually his only demand. Uh, I described how the Washington and New York police are cl- struggling to get that movie stopped, which actually does begin at 2 p.m. and starts to play. Um, once that demand is somewhat met, because the premiere is actually canceled mid-reel, it's stopped, um, Hollis's other demands emerge, which include uh, uh, delivering to him at B'nai B'rith uh, all, the, uh, all the accused murderers, the people who were involved at the massacre at the Hanafi Center four years earlier. On top of that, he also demands the present. He wants um, Wallace Muhammad, who is Elijah Muhammad's son, in the Nation of Islam. He has taken over the organization in the meantime. He wants him delivered, but also his star disciple, the heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali, to be delivered to him. So he's asking for bodies to be delivered, well, people to be delivered to him, and he promises to execute justice, whatever that, well, most people assume that meant that he would kill these people. Um, and then there's a third demand, which is uh, he's asking for $750 in cash. It's a cryptic demand, but that really is pointing to the four years preceding between the massacre and this hostage taking and the experience that Hollis and the Hanafis had in the court system and the judicial system of Washington, D.C. and in America, well, federal judicial system too. Um, and that is uh, his frustrations and $750 is really, in his mind, the price of the injustice that he suffered, he and the Hanafis suffered in the courts. The situation for the hostages is very unpleasant. It does as I'm not going to give anything away too much. I mean, it resolved mostly peacefully, but it was very unpleasant for the hostages. Like I said, the district building was the most violent meeting. I mean, there were shots fired and people died immediately, but it was no less terrifying in the B'nai B'rith. Um, within an hour, they had captured um, over a hundred people. Uh, and the, the, the way they were captured was just overwhelming force and violence um and there was a there were shots fired at the b'nai b'rith as well though nobody died uh, at that location uh there were people re- bleeding from wounds um people's uh, the, the hostages there were piled up on different floors at first on top of each other so there were just mounds of bodies for hours for the first couple of hours uh, that were just stacked people were just thrown on top of each other in piles and so it was, you know, some of these people, just keep in mind, had had escaped uh, the, the Holocaust in Europe. Uh, I mean, they had experienced that. And, and now they were in Washington, D.C., in the heart of Washington, D.C., with bodies piled on each other. Um, the blood mixing with the urine and sweat. It was just horrific. Um, I spoke to several hostages and... And I actually spoke to several hostages who couldn't bring themselves, even after 
close to 50, for more than 40 years later to talk about these events. They just couldn't. Um, but uh, the, the event, the, the takeover of the B'nai B'rith was, was terrible. Eventually, all the hostages were moved to one location on the eighth floor. And that is where the Hanafis and the hostages stayed for the remainder of the crisis over the next two days. Um, the Islamic Center, the third, the second location that was taken over was perhaps the least violent. It was the least violent. Um, but over there, the Hanafis were, also had serious grievances with one one of the hostages, who was the director of the Islamic Center, who the Hanafis believed had betrayed him and had sided with the Nation of Islam. Uh, he was an Egyptian imam named Muhammad Abdul Rauf. Um, so they were, th but he was equally threatened, uh, constantly berated, threatened to, that they would behead him, set him on fire. They had a gas can of gas sitting at his feet the whole time, and uh, so. Yeah, the, all three locations were, were different, but there was terror in all three places. One thing I couldn't decide after reading your book was, is this America's introduction, big introduction to Islam and to the idea of terror coming from Islam? Or does that really not start until the Islamic Revolution in Iran a couple of years later when American hostages are held overseas. And this, this, this episode becomes sort of forgotten. I think you're absolutely right there. This is something I thought about too uh, while writing this, is that was this the moment? And in retrospect, and having looked at this case in retrospect, it's, I don't think that Americans actually made full sense of this at the moment. And it's through the lens of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, which comes only two years later. The Hanafis uh, are st uh, like appealing their case at that time in the federal courts, but uh, when the Iranian Revolution happens. But that really is the moment, I think, where Ameri American consciousness is invaded by this idea of an Islamic militant, an Islamic threat, an Islamic militancy. Khalas is, uh, I mean, the entire pretext of the attack on Washington in 1977 was a religious pretext, though. It was a movie about Muhammad and that whole uh, question of the, you know, the, the taboo around imagery of Muhammad and portrayals of Muhammad in pop culture. So the pretext of this attack was very much a religious pretext. Um, but I think Americans at that time perhaps did not have all the vocabulary and the understanding in general of uh, what Islam was, but also what the uh, power dynamics in the Middle East and in the Muslim world were, and also didn't even fully appreciate America's increasingly deep involvement in the Middle East. And that's a big part of my book is I'm also tracking American foreign policy in the Middle East and how that dynamic is shaping Hollis's life, but also his thinking and his, his um, goal to be, reach the perch of Islamic America as caliph. And I also, I think it's also probably, I'm going to use the word confusing because I can't think of a better word, confusing for Americans because Islam is a rich religion which people associate with the Middle East and with primarily with Arabs, I suppose, no, not, but with the Middle East. And almost everyone you're writing about in this book is a black American. Is that right? There are a lot of black American characters, Muslim, African American Muslim characters. Black Muslims is what the Nation of Islam called them. So I'm trying to differentiate that just like generally African American Muslims in the country. But there are the key players who are also immigrant Muslims, like one of the hostages, Muhammad Abdur Rauf, Khalas's teacher was an immigrant. Um, Master Farad Muhammad, who was the founder of the Nation of Islam himself, which was the black nationalist group that was the first big Islamic group in America, he himself was is believed to be an immigrant. And I talk, I try to trace out his background in the book as well a little bit. So you're right. It is. I mean, what I think I one of the takeaways from my book is that it. It's hard to extricate the black Islamic tradition in America from the immigrant Islamic tradition in America, and that these two things are really tied uh, deeply together. Of course, Islam the story of Islam in America begins on the slave ships. That is undoubted. But how it's revived and the ways in which it develops in the 20th century especially is a story of both black Islam but also immigrant Islam. And, and that there's tension between those two as well. That's something that's part of the story. 
Can you just briefly touch on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Because, I mean, it's a, your subtitle, neither your title nor your subtitle references the fact that uh, Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, are arguably the two most famous ath- athletes in America at the time, are intimately involved in this entire, in all of this, and Jabbar especially. Intimately involved and also on the opposite sides of this. That's what's so amazing. So while Elijah Muhammad has secured the support of Muhammad Ali, and he's his star disciple, uh, Khalis, uh, at the, at a similar time, manages to attract uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Louis Alcindor at the time. He was, in UC- he was still at UCLA. Um, the, you know, by far the most exciting prospect uh, for professional basketball. Uh, and uh, Khalis reaches out to him. Actually, Khalis and Ka- Kareem's father had, had been in the same jazz circles in Harlem. So they knew each other from the jazz days. Uh, and Khalis reaches out to him uh, because he learns about Kareem's general interest in Islam, which was just budding at that time. And Kareem is completely taken by Khalis when he meets him uh, and really throws himself in to the Hanafi movement, into Khalis's mission, because compared to some other groups like the Nation of Islam, but also some of the more militant black groups that Kareem knows about, Khalis strikes Kareem as a much more reasonable guy. He's talking about equality of races, but he's also has, you know, this this thread of patriotism and how blacks belong in America. So Hollis is is preaching this message of of patriotism along with love for all races. And so he sounds quite uh, reasonable to Kareem and he really throws himself in it. When Kareem becomes a pro basketball player though, and the money starts coming in, he signs a massive contract with the Milwaukee Bucks. He uh starts uh, bankrolling the Hanafi movement pretty much on it, you know, single-handedly. And that is what allows the Hanafis to move to Washington, D.C., to that really gorgeous uh, headquarters on 16th Street. It wouldn't have happened without Kareem. Kareem purchased that building for the Hanafis in the early 1970s. Are any of the hostage takers alive today? And did, did they talk to you for the book? I worked on this book seven years and uh, it couldn't have been any later. I, you know, I, there are a lot of people around, not just hostages, but hostage takers too, and negotiators, and some of the you know ambassadors who help with the resolution and all that. So the hostage takers. Um, so there were twelve hostage takers. I and uh, a lot of them have died since, including Khalis. But I was actually able to speak to most of the hostage takers um, uh, who who are alive still. They are some of them are still associated with the, um, the the Hanafi group of whatever remains of it. Some of them are really look back at that period in their lives, and though I don't think anybody used the word cult, but they describe their experiences in that group and in that organization and uh, under Hollis as uh, you know they look back at those events and have no explanation for the ways they were behaving. Uh, at that time and what they believed. And their understanding of Islam uh, has evolved since. They've gone actually down many several traditions of Islam. Um, Khalis' immediate family, though, uh, uh, who are, you know, his, some the children who survive are, are still very much practice Islam in that tradition. Um, the Khalis' immediate relatives, um, blood relatives, none of them actually cooperated with me for this book project. But I did speak to many Hanafis, including the hostage takers. And actually, um, one of Hollis's wives as well. He had multiple wives. Uh, so yeah, you know, they, they, it is an, exp- yeah, they're all over the, they're, they, they, they're across the spectrum, their experiences. Last question. I'm a native Washingtonian. I grew up here, as I said, as a seven-year-old, this, this uh, experience made a mark on me. I remembered it. It was important to me. And yet, honestly, if you think about the the kind of broader history of Washington, if you asked 100 Washingtonians about it, they would not know about this event. It, it didn't, it isn't, it isn't marked in the city the way 9-11 is marked in the city. It's not, it's not deeply important to the the historical life of Washington. Why do you think, or maybe you disagree with that, but it, it feels to me like this book is a revelation because people don't know about it. Why don't we know about it? 
that's a question I, I that I've had some version of this conversation just countless times uh, with the people that I interviewed for the book. A lot of them wondered. A lot of the people who are deeply involved with this uh, in any way wondered the same thing: is how did this get forgotten? And that's something, honestly, I've I, that's something that's hovered over this project. I don't answer it in my book. Uh, it wasn't the project to answer that. But I, I think what we were talking about a little earlier that America honestly didn't know what to make of this. This was a huge huge news event when it happened. It was all of the evening network news, all front pages across the country were covering this crisis when it happened. So it wasn't like this event wasn't covered in the news. It was big news. It was international news. Um, but uh, to make sense of it was another thing in retrospect. And and yeah, almost 50 years have passed since the hostage taking. And, and uh, this is the first time, my book is the first time that anybody uh, has you know, dived into the, dove into the record and tried to recreate the events of that time. So it was forgotten. And you're right. If anything like this were to happen in America today, we would not, there's no way we'd forget about it in 50 years. That's like saying that January 6th is just going to get forgotten in 40 years, which is not. Um, though they are different events, but it didn't register. And I think part of it was that Americans didn't have the vocabulary to describe it. I think uh, it was also over, it was sandwiched between two other major events that are really, uh, that remain present in American memory, which are, which is the Munich massacre in Munich. I think that was the uh, one um, where the Palestinian militants took the Israeli athletes hostage and, and killed and murdered many. And uh, the Iranian revolution uh, of 1979. And in some ways, I think this event in 1977 it bridges our understanding of those two major hostage takings uh, that uh, most people remember. I think the 1977 siege of Washington is what really can allow us to understand how those two moments were connected. Shahan Mufti, thanks for joining me on Gapfest Reads. Shahan's book, American Caliph, is really one of the best books I've read in years. You should get it. You should read it. It's it is gripping. It's so interesting. I learned so much from it, and it's just a fantastic read. So listen to it. Thank you, David. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for the kind words. That's it for this month's edition of GabFest Reads. Our producer, Shana Roth, Ben Richmond, a senior director of operations for Slate's podcast. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GapFest Reads. Until then, me and John and Emily will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GapFest. <laughs>